I'm Katie, this is Rebecca, and here we are in the Exeter Custom House. And behind us on the wall, there's this rather splendid heraldic shield. The lion on the one side, the unicorn on the other. I'm going to tell you a story with a unicorn in it. It doesn't start with the unicorn, but it certainly does end with one. Once upon a time, there was a little tailor, and he lived in a very cramped attic room at the top of a tall townhouse far from here. Well, one day, the little tailor, he was sitting at the window, stitching away at the kind of coat he was never going to afford for himself, when out of the window, he heard a woman calling, jam, jam, jam for sale, and he leaned out of the window. There she was, down on the street below, with a yoke over her shoulder, two wooden pails filled with jars of jam, and, ooh, said the little tailor, I fancy a bit of your jam, come up here and I'll buy some. And so the woman, she went in at the door and she clattered all the way up to the very top and, oh, she said, so, how many jars would you like? Oh, no, you misunderstand me, said the little tailor, I can't afford a jar of jam. I just love a, a spoonful for my bread. I'll give you a packet of pins for it. Well, the woman was a bit put out to have lugged her jam all the way up there, but, well, I guess a packet of pins was better than nothing, and uh, she had to go all the way down anyway, so she unscrewed a jar and put a lovely red dollop on the, the tailor's bit of bread, and then all the way back down to the street. Taylor looked at the jam. His mouth began to water. No, 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 he told himself. I'll get sticky fingers, finish the work first. And so there he sat, stitching and sewing, and he didn't notice, in through the open window, a little cloud of flies settled on the jam. He tied off the last knot on the last button and invited you, he said. You are not welcome at the feast. And he took off his shoe and he brought it down in the middle of the jam. Well now, he had a sticky sole on the bottom of his shoe and the bread and the jam looked a bit worse for wear. There in the middle were seven fat black flies, their little legs waving feebly. But the little tailor, he was pretty pleased with himself. Look at that, he said. Seven at one blow. Well, I am a fine fellow of a man. I think, I think the town needs to know about this. And he snatched up a little red off-cut of silk from the coat he'd been making. He took his very last piece of golden thread and he sewed the words, seven at one blow. He made himself a kind of sash. Well, if he was going out on a journey, he needed provisions. Didn't really fancy that bread and jam anymore. He looked in the larder. There was a little soft cheese. He took it and he put it in his pocket. He clattered down the stairs, out through the door and, oh, there by the door there was a little bush. In the bush there was a bird. He reached his hand into the bush. He pulled out the little bird and he slid it into his other pocket and buttoned it up tight. And then the little tailor, he strutted through the streets of that town. But the people, well, they knew that little tailor well. And seven at one blow, they just rolled their eyes and laughed at him. I am not appreciated here, he said. I need to, I need to get out further into the wide world. And so he walked through the streets of the town, through the gates of that town, out into the wide world.
beyond the gates of the town was the forest. And so the little tailor, he set off walking through the trees of the forest. And it wasn't long before he met somebody coming in the other direction. A rather large somebody. There was a giant striding through the trees, his head in the canopy, just tearing up whatever was in his path. Hey, said the little tailor, watch out down here. The giant stopped. He stooped and he looked down. Seven at one blow, he said. Well, that's about as much as I can manage myself. Are you telling me you are as strong as me? I certainly am, said the little tailor. You just show me how strong you are and I'll prove it. Oh, very well, said the giant. And he bent down and he picked up a stone from the forest floor and he began to squeeze. And he squeezed so hard that the muscles in his arm bulged. The veins in his neck throbbed. He squeezed so hard he went red in the face. And a single drop of water trickled down his wrist. You see, said the giant proudly, I'm so strong I can squeeze water from a stone. Oh, said the little tailor, that's nothing. While the giant had been squeezing, he had slipped his hand into his pocket and he now he concealed the cheese behind his fingers. He bent down, he pretended to pick a stone from the forest floor and he squeezed and at once the juice from the cheese ran dribbling down, his arm dropped off his elbow. And the giant's jaw dropped in amazement. Well! Oh, well, I, oh, I reckon I could throw further than you. And he took the stone he was still holding and he flung it up into the sky. And the two of them watched as it sailed over the treetops, smaller and smaller, out of sight. And then it came crashing down to the forest floor. Ah, said the little tailor, that's nothing. While they'd been watching the stone, he had slipped his hand into his other pocket concealed the little bird behind his fingers and now he pretended to scoop up a stone from the forest floor but really he flung the bird up into the air up 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 a tiny speck the bird suddenly found her freedom found her wings and flew off out of sight while the giant spent a long time waiting for it to come back down but when nothing did his eyes widened in astonishment well, he said, well, maybe you are as strong as me. You are a worthy giant's companion, and I would like to invite you to a meal at my house this evening. Don't mind if I do, said the little tailor. Lead on. And he followed the giant through the forest. And eventually they came out into this great big clearing. And the tailor saw the most enormous house, as high as the trees, this, this huge oaken door. And the giant, he pulled open the door. And the tailor saw there was a big fire inside. And sitting by the fire was another giant, stirring the most enormous black cauldron. Now, said the first giant, this is my friend. He's come to visit for the night. He may not look much, but I'm telling you, seven at one blow, he's as strong as we are. Give him a bowl of stew. So the second giant ladled out stew for them all. And they sat and they ate. And then the first giant, he said that since the tailor was the guest, he should have the bed. And uh, he, he didn't mind sleeping on the floor. Thank you very much, said the little tailor. Don't mind if I do. And he crept into the giant's massive bed. There was this thick red cover over it and he got underneath the cover, but he just, he just couldn't get comfortable. The bed was too huge. He didn't want to offend the giants. They'd been kind enough to give him the best bed. So he, he waited until they seemed to be asleep and then he snuck out and... Uh, 
he thought he would climb the walls of the house into the ceiling so they wouldn't catch him. And uh, across the rafters there was this great big wooden beam so he crawled out on the wooden beam and ah, uh, this was more like it. He settled himself and he was just drifting off when he heard the giants stirring down below. Get up, said the first giant. We need to get rid of that little fellow while he's sleeping. He may not look much, but I'm telling you, he's stronger than the both of us put together. And if we don't do for him, he will surely do for us. Oh, very well, said the second giant. How about we use the cauldron, eh? And so the two of them between them, they lifted the great big cauldron and they staggered over to the great bed and in the dim light it still looked like the tailor was sleeping under the red cover. They lifted the cauldron and they brought it crashing down. The little tailor, watching from the rafters, phew, he thought, that was close. Maybe I'd best get out of here before they find me in the morning. And so he waited until they really had settled down to sleep. And then he snuck along the beam and clambered down the wall of the house. And we didn't want to risk opening the door, disturbing the giants. But out the back wall, there was a little crack just small enough for him to squeeze his way through and ah oh, freedom out in the forest the moon had risen now and the light was rather beautiful in the forest he didn't really feel like going to sleep anymore and so he set off journeying further through the forest <laughs> began to follow it, on and on, through the forest, and then, oh, there was a little clearing. In the little clearing was a little fire. Kneeling by the little fire, there was a, a young woman in a leather jacket and breeches with a, a bow and a quiver of arrows in the dewy grass beside her. And for a moment, the little tailor was completely distracted from the delicious smell of the, the rabbit that she was cooking on the fire by the sight of her lovely face bent over, intent on what she was doing. He took a deep breath. He stepped out into the clearing. Good evening, he said. Um, mind if I join you? She looked up. Seven at one blow, she said. What are you, some kind of hero then? You don't look much like the heroes I've seen before. But, uh, well, you're welcome. Come and sit down. Do you want something to eat? Don't mind if I do, said the little tailor. And he came and he sat beside her there on the grass. And she, she took some pieces of the rabbit she'd been cooking and she gave them to him. And the two of them, they sat there licking the grease from their fingers and laughing and talking. And then suddenly, the young woman, she jumped up. She wiped her hands on her breeches. It's late, she said. I must get back. Oh, oh wait, said the little tailor. I, I'd love to see you again. May I? Can I? She looked at him. Yes, she said, you may, as far as I'm concerned. But it... It is a little unorthodox, us meeting alone in the forest like this. I think if you want to take things further, we need to do things properly. You need to ask my father's permission. Oh, said the little tailor, uh, gladly. Uh, where will I find your father? Follow this path, she said, when it's light. You'll come to a town. In the middle of the town, there's a castle. In the castle, there lives a king. He's my father. You can ask his permission. And the little tailor, he stared at her. The king, he said. Yes, 
She said, and I know that makes me the princess. And you're probably wondering what on earth I'm doing running about in the forest in the moonlight. Well, let me tell you something. Life in the castle can be pretty stifling. Sometimes I just have to get out. But listen, this is my little secret. And I would thank you to keep it that way. And then she turned and she was gone, flitting through the trees, invisible in the, in the darkness of the forest. The little tailor, he slept that night by the embers of the fire in the clearing. But at first light, he was up and he was following the path that she'd shown him through the forest until the trees thinned and, oh, there was a town rather bigger than the, the one he'd left the day before. But as he walked through the streets of that town, the people of that town, they looked at what was written. Seven at one blow, they said to each other, and they gazed at him in admiration. So by the time the tailor came to the castle, well, he was feeling pretty confident, pretty good about himself. He waltzed in past the guards who stood back didn't mess with a man who'd killed seven at one blow. Down the corridor he went, into the throne room, there was the king. Before he could lose his nerve, the little tailor, he bowed low. Your majesty, he said, I have come to ask your permission to meet with your daughter. And if she is willing, I should dearly love to marry her. King looked at him. He was pretty used to suitors appearing to ask for his daughter's hand in marriage, but they were, well, they were usually kings, princes, at least a warrior hero, not a scruffy little commoner like this. Still, what was that? Seven at one blow. Hmm, he'd need to tread carefully here. He thought quickly. Very well, he said. I shall consider your request. But first, you must do something for me. You see, there are two giants out in the forest causing a lot of trouble. Get rid of the giants and, yes, maybe you can meet my daughter. And he was privately thinking, are the giants or get rid of him? But the little tailor, he bowed low. Consider it done, your majesty. And he left that room with a spring in his step. He danced back down the corridor. Giants, he thought. Giants, no problem. As he went out through the gates, he borrowed a sword from one of the guards and he tucked it at his belt and through the town and back into the forest. Well, he knew exactly where to find the giants. He went back to the great clearing, the great house with the oaken door. He slipped in. Oh, good, it was empty. He went across to the wall and he climbed up into the rafters, onto the beam where he'd been the night before. And he waited. Well, it wasn't long before the two giants came back. They roused the fire, they heated up their stew, they ate their meal, grumbling and wondering to each other what on earth had happened to the body of the little tailor. But eventually they settled themselves, one on each of their giant beds. Now the little tailor, as he'd come through the forest, he'd filled his empty pockets with hazelnuts. And he took one now, and he dropped it down, ping, in the middle of the first giant's forehead. And that giant, he sat up, bolt upright in bed, clasping at his forehead. Ow, he said, what do you do that for? Go back to sleep. Go back to sleep yourself, said the second giant. I didn't do anything. After a bit of grumbling, the two of them settled themselves. The little tailor waited. He took another hazelnut and bing in the middle of the second giant's forehead. He too sat up in bed. I told you it wasn't me, he said. Leave me alone. I didn't touch you, said the first giant. Go back to sleep. Well, the two of them slept and the little tailor, he took two more hazelnuts and when he judged it to be the right moment he tossed them down and they landed 
of those two giants, great hairy noses. And the two of them, furious, sprang from their beds and they went at each other kicking and punching and yelling and wrestling so wildly that they rolled over and out the great oaken door. And the tailor, he could hear them crashing about in the clearing, tearing up the trees and walloping each other with the branches. And then suddenly it all went quiet. And he scrambled along his beam down the wall of the house. He peeped out through the oaken door and... Just as he'd hoped, they'd knocked each other out, stone cold dead. Well, all he needed to do now was draw the sword that he'd borrowed and plunged it into the hearts of each of those giants. He wiped the blood from the blade and he set off back through the forest. Well, the next day, he came before the king. Your Majesty, he said. I have killed those giants. You can send your guards to go and check if you don't believe me. The king stared in astonishment. He had not been expecting to ever see this little fellow again. But he thought quickly. Oh, uh, well, he said, very good. But um, huh, well, that was only the first part of the task. As well as those two giants, there's been a fearsome wild boar plaguing our people, tearing up their crops. You must capture the boar before I will consider your request. The little tailor, he bowed, and he turned with a thoughtful expression on his face. Wild boar, hmm. He tried to remember everything he knew about them. Wasn't there some old affinity between the boar and the giant. Giant's blood, maybe. Worth a try, he thought. He went back through the town, back into the forest, back to the clearing of the giant's house where the two giant bodies still lay. He checked out the lie of the land and then he hid himself in a bush to one side of the clearing. Well, later that day, just as it was growing dark, he heard a, a rustling and a grunting and a snuffling coming from the far side of the clearing and oh, the most fearsome creature he'd ever seen in his life. Two enormous tusks, two fierce red piggy eyes, the wild boar snuffled its way into that clearing. It went straight for the first giant and it began to lick the congealed blood. And the boar licked and licked with its bristly tongue, and then, then it began to gobble, devouring the giant's flesh. And while it was engrossed, the little tailor, he snuck round behind the creature, and he pulled hard on the boar's tail, and it turned furious. It charged at him, but the tailor was ready. He turned tail and he ran straight into the giant's house. The boar charged after him, but he slipped out through that crack in the big wall, in the back wall, just big enough for him to squeeze through, and he ran round out the other side, slamming the door shut. Oh, he'd done it. He had the wild boar trapped inside. through the forest, back to the town, back to the castle, back to the king. Your Majesty, he said, it is done. I have captured the wild boar. You can send your guards to go and finish him off. Well, the king, he stared at the little tailor. Was this strange little fellow maybe really worthy of his daughter after all? He needed to be sure. Very good, he said, but uh, if you were to marry my daughter, when she is queen, you would be king. And I need to know that you can care for the people of this town. We have a terrible trouble at the moment, a sickness in the town. They say it comes from the, the water in the fountains. Nobody can find a cure. 
My advisors have told me the only thing, the only thing that can heal the sickness, cleanse the water, is the horn of a unicorn. Bring the unicorn's horn to cleanse the water, and as far as I am concerned, you may marry my daughter. He bowed low, but he turned and he went down the corridor with a miserable expression on his face. What was he going to do? Seven at one blow, maybe. Giants, no problem. Wild boar, consider it done. But a, a unicorn? A unicorn? This was another order of magnitude. Suddenly, psst, he turned. There, peeping through a little door off the corridor, was the, the huntress, the, the princess, in a splendid dress, a golden crown upon her head. Come in here. He looked around and then he slipped through the door into the little room. What's wrong? She said. You look worried. You look sad. Well, said the little tailor. And he told her what the king had asked him to do. And a unicorn, he said. Who ever seen a unicorn? And she smiled. I have, she said. In my time in the forest, in the moonlight, I have encountered the unicorn, and well, maybe I can help you. But you know, those who would catch a unicorn, their hearts must be pure. And there's something about you. I, I like you, but there's something you're not telling me. What is it? And the little tailor, he looked at her. Well, he said, I guess I could tell you a story. You see, once upon a time, in a town far from here, there was a little tailor. He lived in a cramped attic room at the top of a tall townhouse. And one day, he was sitting there, stitching away, when he heard a cry. Jam, jam, jam for sale. And he told her. He told her the whole story. And he told her how the seven at one blow had just been seven fat flies. He told her how he wasn't really stronger than the giants, than the boar. He'd just been lucky. He'd just tricked them into submission. And when he finished, well, I guess, he said, now you know the truth. You're, you're not going to want to have anything more to do with me. But the princess smiled. On the contrary, she said, I like you more than I did before. And don't worry, you've kept my secret. I'll keep yours. And I will help you. I tell you what, meet me on the path to the forest at midnight. And now, well now you really better get out of here before somebody catches us. Go on. And she opened the door and she pushed him through. But the little tailor, oh, the swing was back in his step. He danced back down the corridor, past the guards, through the town, back to the forest. It seemed a long time to wait till midnight. But at last, the sun set, the moon rose, the bells in the town struck midnight, and there she was, flitting through the trees towards him. Not in her princess dress. Not in a huntress dracket, but in a simple white dress, barefoot, hair falling around her shoulders. And she took him by the hand and she led him. She led him into the oldest, wildest, darkest parts of the forest. And the little tailor, he saw a clearing in the moonlight with little silver flowers gleaming in the grass and all around a tangle of, of briars and thorns. She told him exactly what he must do and then she told him he must now hide himself. And so the little tailor, he hid in the bushes and he watched 
as the princess sat down cross-legged in the middle of the clearing and she raised her face up to the moon, the pale light shining on her skin. but with a gleaming golden horn sprouting from his forehead, the unicorn. And the unicorn came and lay down in the middle of the clearing. He laid his head in the lap of the maiden. And the little tailor, he'd done what she told him. He'd unpicked the golden thread from the sash and now he came with trembling hands and he tied the golden thread around the neck of the unicorn. And the unicorn rose to his feet and, well, it wasn't entirely clear whether the little tailor was holding the unicorn or whether rather the unicorn was holding him. The princess sprang up to her feet. It's late, she said, I must get back before I'm caught, but you know what to do, yes? And then she was gone, flitting through the trees. And the tailor and the unicorn, they went together, back through the forest. And in the first light of the new day, they came back to the town, through the streets to the marketplace, where the clear water bubbled in the fountains and the unicorn dipped his golden horn into the water. And at once the water ran clear and pure. And more than that, the people who had been sick, they came and they drank and they were healed. They were well. And the little tailor, well, he cut through the golden thread, the unicorn turned and he ran out of the town, back to the wild darkness of the forest. But news, news of what the tailor had done was already spreading through the town, so by the time he came before the king, well, all doubts had been washed away, and the king, he welcomed him with open arms. I would be delighted to have you as my son-in-law. Let us hear what the princess has to say about it. And in she came. Now, my dear, said the king, I know he doesn't look much, but believe me, he has killed two giants, captured the wild boar, and now he has brought healing to the town. Will you marry him? And the princess, she winked at the little tailor. Do you know what, Father? She said, I think I will. And so the two of them were married, the little tailor and the princess Huntress. And for the rest of their lives, she kept his secret and he kept hers. And so they lived happy ever after. But as for the unicorn, I reckon he's still out there somewhere in the oldest, wildest parts of the forest. And maybe, maybe we need to go in search of him. Goodness knows, we could do with the healing power of his golden horn right now.